And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads, as it were, crowns of gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. One woe was past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. Now, Lord, we ask you to help us tonight uh, to understand what this means during the time of the tribulation period. We know, Lord, that you have warned of that great day of wrath that's coming. And that, Lord, those of us who read the Bible understand that that judgment is ahead for this planet. We are grateful tonight that we don't look for judgment, but we look for Jesus who has delivered us from the wrath to come. And Lord, you will come for your bride to take us home before you declare war on this world. But Lord, we pray that you'll help us as we study through the Bible, that we'll understand that this chapter and these verses help us to understand what it means, help us to understand how it will be fulfilled. And Lord, I know we don't know all the details about how this exactly will be fulfilled, but it's enough. You've given us enough that it's something that is just horrendous and it's terrifying. And we pray, Lord, if there's anyone under the sound of our voice tonight that's not a Christian, that's not saved, that you'd help them to realize what salvation is and what we're being saved from, the judgment and the terrible uh, day of wrath that's coming upon the earth. Lord, give us help tonight. Give us clarity of thought, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, in chapter 8 of <clears throat> the book of the Revelation, and let me just go back up here. Uh, this is a little bit of review tonight as we get into this. <clears throat> um, we know basically that the rapture of the church happens before any of these judgments. Now, the book of the Revelation, really from chapter 6 through chapter 19, um, is uh, really itemizing for us the different judgments that are coming upon the earth. Now, it's not just one judgment. These are a series of judgments. There's a series of three judgments. The first series is the seals, and those are the seals of uh, the uh, document, the, um, the scroll, the title deed of the earth. And we saw those, the first four are the, uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And then the fifth seal is the martyrs. And then the sixth seal is really a prelude to what's coming in the rest of these judgments. And then the seventh seal um, introduces these trumpet judgment. So the seventh seal that we find in chapter 8, uh, God is opening up to us and at the second series of judgments. So the seventh seal, the last seal judgment, opens up a whole series of new judgments. These are called the trumpet judgments. And when we get to uh, the seventh seal, or sorry, the seventh trumpet judgment, uh, well, it will, the same thing happens again. The seventh trumpet judgment is a new series called the bowl or the vile judgments, and there's seven of those. So we'll get into that as we go along. Now, last time, uh, we looked at the first three of the trumpet judgments. That is, the hail fire, the burning mountain, and the wormwood. Tonight, we're going to look at just two. That is, the fourth and the fifth judgments, which is the sun, moon, and stars, and the demonic locusts. So again, by way of review, uh, we have uh, the, the, the last three that we looked at last time. The first trumpet judgment, that was hail, fire, and blood that rains upon the earth. It destroys one third of the trees and all the green grass. So this is a judgment upon the earth. And then the second judgment uh, was a judgment on the seas, so the, the, the land and the sea. And that was the great mountain that was cast into the sea. Um, it's interesting that it's not described the, the way the third trumpet judgment. The third trumpet judgment is a meteor. It's a star, an asteroid that falls from heaven. And yet um, the second tr trumpet judgment doesn't say that it's a meteor, it, it coins it in different language. So it's almost like we have to say, 
Well, a burning mountain is thrown into the sea, but it's not an asteroid. So we're thinking, well, maybe it's a volcano, but what volcano is able to destroy a third of the oceans, okay? And there was one, of course, that we looked at, uh, Tamu Massive, which is the size of France. And instead of the burning, the mountain that is burning, uh, being thrown into the sea from the atmosphere, that is thrown into the sea from underneath. So a burning mountain basically erupts into the ocean. And we saw how that, that would affect really a third of the world's shipping, and a third of all marine life dies, and a third of the sea. Um, and the Pacific Ocean is about 46% of all uh, the, the sea waters on the Earth, so it wouldn't be a problem. It wouldn't really even to affect all of the Pacific to affect one third of the oceans. Now, again, what we're trying to do here is say, you know, how, how is this judgment going to be fulfilled? And the thing about Scripture when you study the Bible, and God is that many times God talks about things that are very, very unusual, very unusual. Um, and yet when God predicts something to happen, even if it is very strange, it always comes to pass, just like he said. So people would be wise to heed the book of the Revelation, even though sometimes it is, uh, you know, it has symbolism and it is um, some, sometimes difficult to understand. It's important that we do understand this because it will happen just as God said. Then the third trumpet, of course, is the burning meteor that contaminates uh, the rivers and the lakes with the fresh water. So the land and the sea and also the fresh water rivers and uh, lakes are contaminated by this burning meteor, meteor that affects one third of the world's water winds. And we, said, we told you that we, we looked it up and you can do the study yourself, but the only place in the world um, the only area in the world that contains one-third of the world's fresh water is Asia. Not North America, not South America, not Africa, not Europe, but Asia is the only place. And we saw that there was that, that place, that epicenter, where if, if a mediator did impact the earth in that place, we're talking Tibet, Mongolia, it would affect the rivers that run north through Siberia and Russia. It would affect the rivers running east through China. It would affect the rivers running south through India. Um, and of course, many, there would be many people uh, affected by that. And the Bible says when, they, when the people drunk the waters, which was made bitter, uh, wormwood, which we said the word wor wormwood in both Ukrainian and Russian is the word, the name Chernobyl. And maybe there's a connection there that, and it may be that, that the rivers are not just physically impacted, but it may be that there's some sort of radiation, there's some sort of toxicity that comes off this meteor that affects the, the fresh water systems, okay? So that, that's uh, the third trumpet judgment. Now, tonight we're going to continue and looking at the fourth trumpet judgment. We're going, tonight we're going to look at the fourth trumpet and the fifth trumpet. Now, again, this is just a graphic to help us to understand where we are in this because you may be, especially when we get to this next one, you're thinking, man, I don't want to be here. Well, if you're lost and the rapture happens tonight, you will be there. Um, you will experience this. The only way to, ex to escape this judgment that's coming is uh, to, be, to, to trust Christ as your Savior. Yeah. Because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, it says, we look for Jesus um, who has delivered us from the wrath to come. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it's, it says that uh, we have not been appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Those verses uh, in the context of 1 Thessalonians are speaking about future things about this judgment that's coming. And so this is where we are here. We believe we're right at the end of the church age. We don't know how close we are. The next event is the rapture, where the Lord Jesus comes for his, he's the bridegroom, we're the bride. He takes us back to the Father's house, as he promised in 1 John 14. And so the removal of the church age saints. And then the seven year tribulation begins after we go. And of course, Jesus talked about this in Matthew 24. And he talks about the first judgments as the beginning of sorrows. The whole tribulation is pictured like a woman giving birth. And uh, the first birth pangs, um, you know, and they're spread far apart. And they're not too severe. But then the, the further you go, they get more, um, they're closer together. And they're more intense. And the closer you get to the, the birth of the child, it's very, very, very intense. They, the woman is travailing in childbirth. That's the picture that Jesus gives of the tribulation period. So these birth pangs are um, maybe not as bad in the beginning. The first seal is the Antichrist, the, the white horse. 
who it's a diplomatic um, cold, uh, cold War type of a situation. Then it develops into a hot war, um, the red horse, and then the black horse, which means famine, and then the pale horse, which means death. And so it, it kind of gains steam. And only when you get to the sixth seal um, is when the sun is darkened and there's things that happen when God um, uh, directly does supernatural things that we don't see today. Supernatural things will happen in this period of time called the tribulation period. So the fourth ju trumpet judgment affects the heavens. So the first judgment affected the earth. The second judgment uh, affected the seas. The third judgment affected the waterways. And the fourth judgment is going to affect the heavens. Now, at the end of the tribulation period, Jesus comes back to the earth. We come back with him. And the Bible says that the Lord will come with ten thousands of his saints. And in Revelation 19, his wife has made herself ready. We're in heaven. Revelation 19, the church is pictured in heaven. And we come with the Lord as he comes in victory. And when he comes, he um, judges those who have survived. Uh, many will be saved and will enter into this kingdom on the earth that the Bible speaks about. Where the lamb and the lion, or the lamb and the wolf will lie down together. The lamb will eat straw like the ox. They'll beat their swords in the plowshares. They shall not learn war anymore. There will be peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 we know. On the us a son is given. On the us... Um, uh, a child is born, on the us a son is given. But the next verse it says, And his, uh, his government shall be peace without end upon the throne of his father David. So Isaiah 9, 7, speaking about his earthly throne on the earth. So all through the Old Testament prophets, we have the Messiah here as King of Israel, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. And the earth has changed. It goes back to like an Eden, like a Garden of Eden type existence. And of course, we come back with him. We'll be there. The whole idea of, well, we die as Christians, we go to heaven, we get wings, we get harps, we're sitting on clouds, is completely foreign to the reality that we will have. There's many, many things, wonderful things that we, we will experience when we come back with the Lord in our resurrected bodies, and it's going to be a wonderful time. Okay, um, so the two judgments we're looking at tonight, then, is we're moving now on to the fourth judgment, and the fourth judgment um, is the judgment upon the sun, moon, and stars. So that's in verse number 12. So let's look at that again in verse number 12. <clears throat> and the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the, light, the night likewise. Um, now I think... Um, as all of these judgments to some extent are temporary in the sense that in the first judgment all the green grass was burned up and yet when we come to the fifth judgment um, we find that the locusts are commanded not to touch the, any green thing, the trees and so on so the grass had regrown um, and just like there were, were things that happened in the heavens in the sixth seal in chapter 6, do you remember? Let's look back at chapter 6 and verse number 12, I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of her, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Now again, we looked at this last time, the word star there is, is uh, aster, where we get the word asteroid from. So we're not thinking about one of these big stars in air space, because it, you know, it would burn the whole earth up uh, before it actually hit it. Uh, we're talking about asteroids that will fall from the heavens. But what we see here is that already in the sixth seal, um, the, uh, the sun became dark, it became black, and the moon became as blood. So the, uh, the lights of heaven have already been affected in that one judgment. So it looked like possibly that has went away. We also, uh, by the time you get to this fourth judgment, we also see um, in verse... Um, uh, verse 2 of chapter 9, that when the bottomless pit is opened and the smoke comes out, it says, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So it could be that some of these, these judgments, um, uh, the effect of them um, is, is repaired over a period of time because we see the heavens are darkened in chapter 6, the sixth seal. Uh, we see they're darkened when the bottomless pit is opened. And if you go over to uh, Matthew chapter, I think I'm getting ahead of myself here, but look at Matthew chapter number 24. 
at the end of the tribulation period, after the tribulation, when Jesus comes back, again, the sun, moon, and stars are affected. And so in verse 29, it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So here we see the sun and moon being darkened again. So I think all through the tribulation period, you're going to see these signs in the heavens where uh, the sun, moon, and stars, the light from the sun, moon, and stars is going to be affected. Um, and it, like in chapter 6, it was affected, but it, it must have got repaired again um, as time went on. And then here in this fourth judgment, we have the sun, moon, and stars again being affected. And then at the end of the tribulation, they're, they're affected again. So what does this mean then when it says that um, a four, the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten? Well, you will remember, um, as we talked about the first three judgments, and possibly especially uh, the second judgment, it said that the great burning mountain of fire was cast into the sea. So we're thinking this volcanic um, activity. And again, uh, uh, Tamu Massive, which is the largest volcano system, they say it's extinct, but the largest uh, volcano system in the earth and almost the same size, in fact, it's broader than uh, the one on Mars, which is the largest volcano in our solar system. Um, when that thing blows, not only will it erupt um, into the sea, I think it'll, it'll, the, the smoke and the ice will come up out of the sea. And we know from experience that when volcanoes are up like that, um, it affects really our whole weather system. Um, when these volcanoes in Iceland recently, and another one in the, um, the South Pacific, when it blew, there were planes that could not fly because of the ice that was in the atmosphere. It chokes, it chokes up jet engines, and basically the engines stopped working, so they can't put our airliners in the sky. But not only that, um, when the ice goes into the atmosphere like that, I mean, we're talking not just a, a small volcano, but this is like the biggest volcano that has ever erupted. When that gets into the atmosphere, it affects the atmosphere. And so that um, uh, it affects the light that we get from the sun and moon and stars. Now, um, it could be that through these judgment, God takes natural things and mixes that with his supernatural uh, design in these judgments. He uses natural things, just like in Pharaoh's time, uh, he used the natural May River and turned it to blood. He used uh, the, the frogs and uh, filled the land with frogs and lice and boils. These are natural things that occurred, but God used them as a judgment. It could be that the volcano and the ice that's in the atmosphere does affect the sun, moon, and stars. Okay, And of course, scientists um, are trying to tell us that this has already happened upon the earth and that's why the dinosaurs are extinct because of a meteor from outer space and uh, the impact and the, what was produced with the ice and the dust because of that. Now a lot of that's conjecture. Uh, we're not sure but what we find here in verse 12 is that God as a part of his judgment with this angel sounded uh, it says the third part of the sun was smitten. So whether God actually affects the literal um, uh, lights in the sky, the, uh, the sun, the moon, and the stars, or whether it's our perception of that from planet Earth, what we find is a third part of the light of the day and a third part of the light of the night is extinguished. Okay? So we're, we're basically existing on two-thirds of the light uh, that was known before. Um, look over... At Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, um, look over at Zechariah chapter 14. Actually, go before you go, look at Matthew again. Look at Matthew 24. In verse 29, we saw already that after the tribulation, we see the sun is dark and the moon shall not give her light. So this is something that happens, I think, several times through this period of judgment. What is God doing? It's, it's something that's universal. Everybody in the whole world, you know, when the third part of the ships are destroyed and the third part of the rivers, well, there's still two-thirds of the world that's unaffected. But this is something that everybody sees. It affects every single person. And uh, God is um, speaking to people um, and actually trying to get people to repent. That's why you have the next verse where it talks about the angel going through heaven and uh, pronouncing the woes as judgment. But I want you to look at uh, Matthew 24 and verse 21. 
Jesus said, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world of this time, no, nor ever shall be. So he's speaking about the abomination of desolation, verse 15. That's the middle of the tribulation period, and specifically speaking about great, great tribulation upon the Jewish people, the great persecution uh, that the Antichrist brings upon them. But notice in verse 22, and it says, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now this poses a little bit of a problem here, because the tribulation period is a specific period of time. Where do you get that? Daniel chapter 9. So there's a calendar of events. We can't go into all the detail of that. We've been through it several times. But 490 years are pronounced as a calendar upon the start point where Artaxerxes commands to rebuild Jerusalem and the end point when Jesus comes and fixes everything. 490 years. You said it was a long time ago, Artaxerxes. It was like 445 BC. Yeah, because after 483 years, Jesus came and presented himself. In fact, it tells you that in chapter 9, verse 26. Unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks, 16, 69 weeks, and the Messiah is going to present himself. Well, what did they do? Well, it says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. In other words, it predicted when Jesus would come at the 69th week, that Jesus, after the 69th week, that Jesus the Messiah would die. So then we have this period, this long period of time. In other words, the calendar was put on hold. God reached across to the pendulum of time in that calendar and he stopped it. And now for the last 2,000 years there has been this gap into which the church age um, has been slotted into. But there's still one week or seven years of that period of time that has been unfulfilled. And at the end of that seven years is when Jesus comes back. That's the calendar that was given to Daniel to comfort him concerning the future of his people. So <clears throat> what we're looking at is a specific period of time. Each, each year is made up of 12 30-day months, 360 days in that prophetic year. Where do you get that? From the first 69 weeks, the first 483 years. That's how it was calculated. So if the first 69 weeks are 360-day years, then the last seven years will be seven years of 360 days so you can actually calculate how many days the tribulation period is now why am i telling you all this because he says the days of the tribulation will be shortened well how can they be shortened if it's a specific period of days and time you know how's he going to shorten it and this has been a problem hasn't it and he says except those days should be shortened, no flesh should be saved the tribulation period is so intense that there has to be a way where God um, makes it less intense. Otherwise, everybody would die. At least all the believers would die. The elect, which is speaking about the saved Jews, the saved Gentiles at that time would die. So what, what exactly could an answer to this be? And there's been different um, you know, options put on the table for this. But for, for me, a favorite is this, is that when he says that the days should be shortened, He's not speaking about the number of days. He's speaking about the time within the day. So you say, well, how could that happen? Well, let's look over at Zechariah. Look at Zechariah chapter 14. So if the sun and moon and stars were darkened by a third, then you'd have to say that um, all activity as far as uh, persecution and people going after and fighting one another, um, you know, that that would be somehow suspended or um, it would be subdued uh, by the, the, the time being, being shortened. And what we find in Zechariah is something kind of interesting. So what I'm saying is that when God does this with the sun, moon and stars, um, that either the time itself of the day um, or the ability for people to operate um, in daylight, as it were, would be, would be greatly shortened. So in Zechariah chapter 14, verse number 5, it says, and this of course is the second coming. If you look at verse 3, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought on the day of battle. If you read the context here, this is Jerusalem. Antichrist is attacking the Jewish people. Um, they're about to get wiped out. And then all of a sudden the Lord comes, and that's Jesus and in verse 4, his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Where did Jesus go from? Where did he ascend from? 
he ascend from the Mount of Olives on the east of Jerusalem. And the angel said, this same Jesus that is taken from you shall so come in like manner. So where is Jesus physically going? To, now, he's going to come in the air for us. He's not setting his feet on the, on the earth when he comes for us. But when the next time his feet touches planet earth, what part of the planet will it be touching? The Mount of Olives. And here it says, in the Old Testament, verse 4, And his feet, the Lord's feet, shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. So this is the second coming of Christ here. Verse 5, and ye shall flee to the valley of uh, the mountains, uh, to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Ye uh, shall flee, ye shall, uh, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. Now watch, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. That's us, by the way. The Lord my God shall come. This is the second coming. And it shall come to pass in that day. Now watch verse 6. That the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light, and it shall be in that day that living water shall go from Jerusalem. So there's something that happens um, in the tribulation and specifically at the second coming of Christ and possibly just prior to that. Um, that he says that at the evening time it shall be light. Uh, it shall be one day which shall be known unto the Lord. It's almost like people can, uh, are not aware of time. But something's going to happen, and I think it's predicated by what happens in the heavens here. And that the earth, the days are shortened. And certainly uh, with one third of the light of the day and the light of the night, basically being non-existence, complete darkness, that you would not be able to, uh, they certainly wouldn't be, be able to find people who are hiding and so on. Um, and that's possibly how God is able to protect the elect at, at that particular time. But this is a judgment upon the heavens. So let's move on then to um, the fifth trumpet judgment. And just before we get to that, I want you to notice verse number 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets or the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. So um, you'll notice up on our, our graphic here that we have four, we have seven angels uh, representing the trumpet judgments, the, the, these angels sound. You notice that there's four here that sound and then there's three that are yet to sound. So that's not by accident, when somebody put that graphic together, that's what they were speaking about. Now, we're kind of teaching it out of order. We should have taught the fourth trumpet last week and then get into the last three uh, tonight. But what we're finding here is that these last three judgments are way, way more severe than the first four judgments, and you're going to see that uh, tonight. Um, the first, uh, most of the first four, certainly the, the middle two, were localized judgments not everybody was affected by uh, and even in the first judgment um, it was it may have been limited to some extent and certainly in this fourth judgment the sun moon and stars um, you know they're going to see it but it's not going to personally touch their lives physically touch them but when it comes to the last three it's these are these are really awesome judgments and that's going to touch everybody where they live uh, these, these judgments are going to knock on your door um, and so it's, and, and so these are these last three judgments are called the three woes. That's why he says in chapter nine, verse twelve, one woe is past. The one woe that is past is the fifth trumpet judgment, which we're going to look at now. And then he says, and behold, there are two woes more hereafter. In other words, God is upping the ante; he's tightening the screws here, and that's why God works. You know, in the plagues upon Egypt, he started with the Nile River and then frogs in your ovens and so on. But when you get to the last plague and your firstborn is dying, the judgments get more severe the longer it goes. And that's exactly what's going to happen here as well. And what's really the, the purpose of God doing that? He's trying to get people's attention, even lost people in the tribulation period. And, you know, there, there are witnesses, the 144,000, they're giving the gospel. And the intention of God is that people would repent. In fact, if you look at the last part of chapter 9, 
in verse 20, it says, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, uh, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they uh, of their murders, of their sorceries, or their fornication, or their thefts. God's trying to help them to see that their, their sin is, has consequences and the real judgment that's touching them is a, a coming upon their lives. And so even in the time of judgment, tribulation, God is still trying to see people get saved. And so in verse 13, we have this angel. And of course, through the midst of heaven, he's not speaking about the heaven of heavens. I think he's actually speaking about the atmosphere. He's speaking with a loud voice so people can hear. This is a warning from God. He says, now, four judgments are past and three are coming. And woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels which are yet to say this is a basically a warning uh, that the angels flying through the first heaven which is the atmosphere where people are able to hear this loud voice of this angel as he's warning them you've seen some judgment you haven't seen anything yet you need to repent and turn to god and god is warning of these next three judgments as more severe and they are the three woes so tonight we're looking at the first woe, which is the fifth trumpet judgment here in chapter number 9, verses 1 to verse number 11. So what is the fifth trumpet judgment? Well, it's, and this is where it's really weird, because we're going to speak about creatures that you have never seen. They are described to us in ways uh, that would be meaningful to us, but nobody has ever seen this creature and you don't want to ever see this creature this is a creature that comes out of the bottomless pit and so i'll tell you what we'll do we'll notice a, a few things about this first of all uh these i think that they're demon creatures because of where they come from but this first woe are demon creatures from the bottomless pit so first of all i want to notice the origin of these creatures in verses one through three in chapter nine the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven onto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Okay, now we have to ask, what is this star? Again, up to this point, when stars are falling from heaven, they're meteors. Okay, they're meteorites, they're asteroids. An asteroid that falls upon the earth is renamed a meteor. Uh, but then he says, to him, the star that fell is a him. So sometimes in the scriptures, stars represent different things there are places in scriptures where the leaders of israel were called stars and how they were thrown down and trampled under feet of men um, and so in this case the star that is falling from heaven uh, we believe to be an angel um, and i believe it's a fallen angel if you look over chapter 12 in verse number nine now, we'll get into this in more detail in chapter 12 later, but chapter 12 is the middle of the tribulation period. In the middle of the tribulation period, Satan is thrown out of heaven. Now, you might say, well, Satan's already been thrown out of heaven, and that's true, and, and a third of the angels fell with him, and some of those angels are in chains in a place called uh, Tardis under the earth. Could be the abyss or the bottomless pit. Um, but in chapter 12 here, we find that Satan is permanently banned from heaven. Because in the book of Job, Satan came into heaven uh, to appear before God. And God said to, to Satan, hast I considered my servant Job? And uh, Satan is, um, he uh, accuses us to God. How does he do that? Well, he has access to God in heaven. And yet the Bible also says that uh, the devil walks to and fro on planet earth, seeking whom he may devour. And so he lost his position and the unholy angels lost their access and position before God. Um, but it's not to say that, uh, that, he, that, that Satan, who is the prince and power of the air, um, and he does have um, principalities and powers, uh, that's, that these creatures, these angelic beings that have fallen, have access before God. Because in verse 9 uh, of chapter 12, the great dragon which was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren 
is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. They loved not their lives on the death. And so we find, um, like in verse 12, it says, uh, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So the middle of the tribulation time until he's cast into the bottomless pit is how long? Anybody know? Three and a half years. It's a short period of time. We also believe that the beast, the Antichrist, in the middle of the tribulation period is indwelled by Satan. Okay? And that's when he really turns upon the Jewish people. So I believe that this is a fallen angel in chapter 9. We also find in verse 11 that these creatures have a king over them. And I think it's the same person that we're talking about in verse 1 and in verse number 11. Verse 11 says they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. And so both Abaddon and Apollyon, uh, the interpretation of that name or word is destroyer. And so this angel is a destroyer, okay? And I think this is a fallen angel. I think there's a real strong possibility that these creatures that come out of the bottom of the pit that we're going to look at here in just a moment um, are also possibly either influenced or indwelled um, by demonic creatures. You remember when Jesus went to the demoniac of the Gadarenes and he was indwelled by legion? Uh, you know, legion is like a thousand uh, soldiers. And uh, they cried for Jesus to cast them in, out of the demoniac of the Gadarenes into the swine, the pigs that were feeding nearby. And so Jesus allowed that to happen. They didn't want to go back to the abyss. So, I mean, there's things about this we don't really understand, okay? There's, there's, there's angels that are bound in hell, in, in Tardis, in the abyss. And yet there are also angels that are roaming around on planet Earth and affecting people. There is a real... Um, um, thing that happens um, on the earth, the prince and power of the earth, uh, Satan, the god of this world, and his hierarchy of angels that are affecting people who can indwell and who can possess people. Now, angels, uh, fallen angels cannot possess believers because every believer has the Holy Spirit in him. And the demon would have to throw out the strong man in order to come in to you. He can't do that. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But, but we have the, so Jesus cast these, these demons into the, into the swine. The swine ran down the hill steeply and were drowned in the lake of Galilee. Now, if, if demons can indwell pigs, is it beyond comprehension that demons could um, also indwell Insects or locusts, I think it's possible because of what happens here. So let's read on then. And, uh, and so the, uh, verse, verse 1, uh, to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Jesus has all the keys. Chapter 1, he has the keys of, of death, hell, and the grave, okay? Jesus has authority over all things. He has the keys to the bottomless pit, Jesus. And when we find over in chapter 20, it would be worth looking there for just a second. Chapter 20, um, in verse 1. Uh, when Satan is actually bound in the bottomless pit. Verse 1 of chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on that dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. So, um, by the way, Satan is not in the bottomless pit right now. Peter says he's alive and well walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Okay, but there is a time coming when he will be bound in the bottomless pit, and the bottomless pit will be sealed and locked with the key, and he'll not be able to get out. Um, so those are some of the things we can learn from as we come to chapter 9. So verse number 2, and he opened the bottomless pit. So this fallen angel, I believe this fallen, I think it's the same person that we find in verse 11, a bottom or polyon. I think this is the king of these, these creatures. He opened the bottomless pit and there rose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. So think about this. The bottomless pit exists right now somewhere. I read, uh, I read some articles this week about 
Somebody posed the question, a question. This is a scientific, scientific community. It had nothing to do with the big of the revelation. But they were saying, is it possible if we dug a shaft that went right through the whole earth, you know, dig from here to China, if you went right through the whole earth and you put a cylinder so nothing could affect everything in that shaft, and you were to fall into that shaft, what would happen to you? Well, but, and they brought all these other things out, like the rotation of the earth, you'd basically bang up a bit against the side of it. So they said the shaft would have to go from the North Pole to the South Pole. And then you'd have to remove all the air out of it. If the air was there, you only basically go on somewhere between 200 and 300 miles an hour as you fall through that shaft. If you take the air out, you can go up to 4,000 miles an hour. So you basically go through that shaft in a period of 40 to 45 minutes. And, but what would happen when you get to the other end? Well, then you would be pulled back the other way. And if it was a vacuum, you would just go back and forth because gravity would pull you both ways. You would fall, you would fall, and then there would be enough momentum to take you through the other side against the gravity, and then the gravity would hold you back and bring you back the other way. It would be like a back and forth. It would be like a bottomless pit. You would never hit bottom. Now, how the Lord works all of that, I don't know. But he says there's a bottomless pit, there's a bottomless pit, and exists today. We don't know where it is. I don't want to know where it is, but it exists today. But there's a coming a time in the tribulation period when the bottomless pit is opened. And what's going to come out? Verse 2, and he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit. Obviously, we know the center of the earth is molten, uh, volcanoes, smoke, ice, all of that. So you'd imagine smoke coming out of the bottomless pit. And uh, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So here we are again, where the atmosphere has been affected by the smoke. And this is not just a localized thing. I think this is a world. This, there's a lot of smoke coming out of this thing that affects the whole atmosphere. Then in verse 3, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. Now, <clears throat> that's a locust. And uh, we, we, we're not really affected by them here in America, but there are places around the world where people absolutely are afraid of these things. If you're a farmer and you've grown a crop and a plague of locusts comes, the, the locusts can come in and absolutely wipe out everything that is green um, on your property because they swarm. Here's the desert locust swarm can be 460 square miles. 460 square miles. That's, that's a lot of property. And in every half a square mile, you can have 40 to 80 million locusts. And that's what it looks like. The sky becomes black with these things. And they land, you know, I saw movies when I was a kid about these locusts, you know. And they land on a green field and about 10 minutes later they take off and there's nothing green left. They basically eat everything um, on, that, on that pasture. So there's a lot of places around the world where locusts are a very, a, a very fearful thing, especially for those who are in agriculture. So just imagine now the, the smoke bellowing out of this bottomless pit. And so you can't really even see. Um, and all of a sudden, in the smoke, locust swarms of locusts come flying at you um, from the smoke. And they're all around you. Now, locusts are not very big. You know, they're, they're about that size. Some people think that these locusts come out are, are bigger, but I don't think they have to be. They're basically that size, but there's trillions and trillions and trillions of them that come out. Let's read on in verse 3. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. So these, these creatures have a certain ability and a certain purpose. And I think they're also cognizant of the fact that they're obedient in verse 4. And it was commanded them. Okay, so somehow these these creep these insects are able to understand commands. That's why I believe um, there's a great possibility here that these are actually demonic creatures. That these are indwelled by demons who understand what their mission is, and they have parameters. They're not allowed to touch the green. They're not allowed to eat the grass. They're not allowed to eat the trees or anything green. It was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing. Neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, well, who has the seal? Will the 144,000 have the seal? I, I think it's a, a, a good possibility that anybody who's saved, you know, the Lord knows those that are his. 
And I think that um, uh, this is, a, this is a, ju a judgment, even though it's demonic, it's, it's directed by, as a judgment of God. And I don't think uh, that saved people who get saved after the rapture, who are in this tribulation time, uh, would be subject to that. The 144,000 certainly weren't. And it could be true also of other, other believers as well. So who are they going after? They're going after lost people. They're going after God's enemies. This is a judgment upon uh, the rebels. Now verse 5 says, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. So what, what is their job? Their job is to sting people. Um, with this thing like onto a scorpion. Now we're going to look at the description here in, in just a moment. Um, but if you were swarmed about with locusts that were basically scorpions or had scorpions tails. And so it wouldn't be just like one sting. It would be probably several stings. And this is much, much worse than like a bee sting. Um, and this is uh, given to all the people of the world uh, like a, a plague of... of of, of Egypt, like um, it's going to be, um, it's going to affect everybody individually. And these things, um, now I think we live in DeKalb County, which I think is one of two in Tennessee where we have brown scorpions. And anybody have brown scorpions where you live? Just me and Leslie? <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure, I was stung by some, I wasn't sure it was, a, we, we do have them. And uh, I mean, we, we, we get them in the house sometimes. I get into the shower one day and there was this, and I took my glasses off and there was this black thing, I don't know what it was. And I put my heel on it and I felt, actually I felt it before I saw it. And I said, what is that? And I looked and it was a, some, a, it was like a black thing. I said, what? Now wait a minute. And I got my glasses, it was a scorpion. I stood on the scorpion and it didn't sting me, thankfully. And we got some pretty good size ones made about that. None of these are going to want to come to my house after this. <laughs> they're, they're about this long. And they just look, you know, it's got the little claws in the front and it's got that stinger in the back. And, you know, now if you go out west, they're, they're bigger, you know, and people can die for those, from those things. They're very, very severe, okay? And so this is a judgment. This is a trump, the fifth trump, tr this is a woe from God. And in verse 6 it says, And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. And shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Now, I don't really understand that. There's a couple of things you get out of that. One is that I think as a result of the pain, they're actually tormented. If you look down at verse number 10, they had tails like this, uh, on the scorpions, and they were, there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. So you could go out, wouldn't be you, but a man could go out when this the smoker, and he goes out, what is all this smoke? And all of a sudden, this plague of swarm of locusts come flying right at him and he gets stung in the head and he gets stung in the, stung in the arms, he gets stung in the body, stung, stung in the legs. I mean, several, several stings that are just excruciating pain. And then he gets stung again in the evening and he goes out the next day and he gets stung the next day. People are locked in their houses, carring in their basements. Who knows what these, uh, these creatures are able to do as far as how they're able to get into places and but it's going to be excruciating for a period of five months. And people actually want to die. They desire to die. But somehow they shall not find it and death shall flee from them. I, that's a bit I don't understand. If a man wanted to die and yet he's not able to die. And I thought, and I don't know, this may be philosophy. Maybe these, these things debilitate people. You know, maybe it's where they paralyze you that you're not actually able to, you know, but then how would they eat and so on? I don't know. But maybe, you know, if they wanted to take their life and go out and, you know, hang themselves, they're just not physically able to do that because these, beasts, these uh, scorpions things actually debilitate them in some way. I don't know that, but it just seems strange that they, if they wanted to die that they couldn't do it. But somehow God prevents them from dying in some way, whether it's the sting or some other, some other means. Now, let's look at their description. Their origin is from the bottomless pit. And their purpose is to hurt men. To torment people five months with stings like scorpion stings. And men shall desire to die. Their description is found in verse 7 through verse number 10. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were as it were crowns of gold. 
and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had their hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots and uh, of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like on the scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Now, many people have tried to uh, kind of depict what these creatures might look like. My personal view is that they're not the size of horses, and they don't look like horses. They're locusts, so, but they're a specific kind of locusts. So I think they're still the size of locusts that we would know today. And it's, their effect is in the, the number of them. They are swarmed like, like locusts today. Um, so they have, they have wings. And I think when it talks about uh, they're, they're like battle horses is that they have armament. Um, they have some sort of armor. You know, some bugs have armor. And have you ever tried, you know, uh, well, um, I'm trying to think of some of the bugs I've tried to kill recently. We have quite a selection where we live. But some bugs are hard to kill. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, they're like, they're reinforced. Now, these are, these are prepared, horses prepared on the battle. It could be, you say, well, I would, just, I would just swap them. I would get the, you know, I would get the chemicals out and I would be beaten with a, with a bat or something. But maybe these things are indestructible. You can't kill them. What happens to them after the five months? They must go back to the bottomless pit. I don't know. But it doesn't say anything about us, uh, people being able to defend themselves. That they, they're armoured. And it might be that you, know, you can swing at a bat with them all day long, but you're not going to kill them. You're not going to put them out of action because they're armoured. Then uh, the, the face of them, it has the face of a man. Now that would freak me out right there. <laughs> that would be all I need to see right there. I would just be, I would be like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> In other words, these creatures are terrifying. Aren't you glad the young people are in here tonight to hear this? <laughs> Nightmares, all right. Oh, dear. Um, these are terrifying, terrifying creatures. They're designed to be terrifying. This is a judgment of God. And they have, um, the Bible says they have golden crowns. They have their hair as the hair of women. Now, that's kind of interesting. What's the difference between the hair of women and the hair of men? The color. Curly or non-curly? Well, men have curly hair, women have curly hair. Men have blonde hair, women have blonde hair. What is the difference between man's hair and, uh, and, and uh, women's hair? The only difference, the only possible difference is the length. So, and we reflect that. And we've got the, in 1 Corinthians 11 says that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. Um, if a woman have long hair, it's her glory. And that's why most of the women in here have long hair and most of the men have short hair. And I think we should follow that. Because I, I'm a man. I'm not a woman. So therefore I have a man's haircut. I don't have a woman's haircut. My wife has a woman's haircut. She has long hair. Okay? Enough said. These things have women's hair. I mean, there's hair. You know, just, and they're flying around. And they've got a man's face on there. And the hair, the long hair is there. And they've got these. I'm, I'm freaked out just thinking about it. And then they have the teeth of a lion. Big old teeth. Now, they don't, they don't hurt with their teeth, but you see, a lot of this, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a terrifying creature. It's a terrifying scene. It's horrifying. It's monsters. These are monsters. You know, the worst, the worst uh, I, don't, I don't watch um, horror movies. For me, real life is scary enough, to be honest with you. And I, I don't, I don't, last time I watched them as a teenager, I don't watch them anymore. Don't, it doesn't entertain me one bit. Because reality is worse than what they can. And this, this stuff here that's coming upon the earth, this is man's worst nightmare. You say, this is fantasy. No, it's not. It's going to happen, just like God said. So they have wings, and so they fly, and there's, and there's millions, trillions of them flying around. And it wouldn't be just one sting. It might be, it might be dozens of sting that a person would get in one time. And uh, every, for a period of five months, this is a plague upon the earth. But this is the business end right here. This is the scorpion tail. And these, these locusts have tails on them like scorpion tails. And they're able to sting like a scorpion. It's horrifying. Um, now, people have tried to explain this. The best way to understand the Bible, even in the book of the Revelation, um, 
If the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense. Don't try to make it something else. Now, some people have tried to do that. And they say, well, this is speaking about modern warfare. And so, and this, this, this really gets fanciful, okay? So here you have the wings with the sound of an army of horses drawn by chariots. So these, these swarming insects, I mean, the noise would be deafening. And so you can understand what they're saying. So the wings are like the wings of a helicopter, and it creates a lot of noise. And then you have the teeth of a lion. Well, that's kind of strange. And then the faces of men, well, that's also kind of strange. This is really strange, a crowd of gold. You know, the cavalry have this uh, insignia on their helicopters. Breastplates of iron, so they're armored. Tail of a scorpion, you know. That's worth thinking about. But let me ask you something. Are these things designed to hurt or to kill? Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the, the Cobra helicopters don't go out to hurt people. They go out to kill people. These are designed to kill. The sting's not in their... The, the, you never have this, their, their rockets back here in the tail. They're always up here, the rockets. So I, th I think this is a fanciful uh, idea. I don't think it's true. Um, I think what we're going to have is a swarm of these demonic controlled creatures from the bottomless pit who are going to hurt men for a period of five months. And God calls this the first woe. Before these three start, he warns them with an angel in the heaven crying, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And God's intention is, it's getting worse. Yeah. Hello? Are you listening now? Will you come on to me now? Will you repent? You know what happens? They don't repent. Tells you what man is. And so, what we find is, in verse 12, one woe is past, and behold, there are come two woes more hereafter. You know the next one? is even worse the next one is even worse and we're going to look at that next time that's why i didn't put it into nice message because it's too involved and we'll be looking at that next time dear father we